Do you ever daydream about what it would be like to live in another period? I think it's common among most people, but especially in the church and especially today. We look around, and particularly in the Western world, we see a lot of decline. Churches that were once the bedrock of a city are emptying out. Catholic schools that educated generations of children are closing their doors. There are scandals and anti-church movements. Society as a whole seems to be unraveling and turning away from God. I listen to stories like this all the time from the friars. They remind me often of what we once did, how many we once were. They look with sadness at everything they once knew fading away. For many people, there is a longing to return to some past glory of another era. They look at the world we're in and what's ahead, and all they can do is sigh with disappointment. Me? I couldn't be more excited. Really, what a time to be a Christian. You might be thinking that this is the hottest take I've ever had, that this clearly must be clickbait just to get you in some provocative title and then I'm going to explain something else. But that's not the case. I really would rather live right now with everything going on in the church than any other time in recent history. And it's not even close. When we look at our congregations now, yes, they are shrinking and getting smaller. That cannot be denied. But I think that we're right on the cusp of getting younger and maybe even growing again. Let's look at the friars for an example. From the 1920s to the 1950s, we had a boom of vocations that had never been seen before in the church. As we've receded to more normal numbers of late, even increasing ever so slightly in the past decade, the total number of friars has aged and dropped off significantly, but we're not going to continue this trend forever. In a decade, maybe two, that generation will be completely gone, and all we'll be left with are those who decided to join after it began to fall, after the priest abuse crisis, after it was the normal thing to do. We're still going to shrink a considerable amount in the near future, probably cut in half in the next 10 years. But then there's going to come a time when our average age is going to go down and the total number is going to stabilize or even go up. Presumably, this will be the case for the church at large as well. The largest segment of our church is among the elderly who will, sadly, pass away soon. When they go, the total number will drop, but so will the average age, making us younger, more active, and most notably, more committed than we have been in previous generations. When we look to that generation, that of the 1940s, we see peak Catholicism, packed churches, and huge collections. And there's definitely an appeal to that. Who doesn't love to see a lot of people on our side? But how deep was the faith back then? I don't mean to suggest the faith wasn't alive. We obviously had saints and heroic people, of course. But for the average parishioner, the regular person coming to Mass each week, how committed were they to the Gospel? A lot of people came to Mass, yes. A lot of people made donations to the Church. Many people may have kept the devotions and followed all the rules, creating a culture of Catholicism. But there is a big difference between adhering to the external expectations of a culture and living as a truly redeemed, fully committed disciple of Christ. How many people of that golden age of Catholicism went to Mass every week simply because that's what people did, because that's what the culture dictated? There were social pressures to be a part of it and fear of ridicule, even punishment, for dissociating from the church. I'd like to suggest that it was not a non-negligible part of the congregation that went to Mass simply to fulfill an obligation. And it continued for generations, even in some today. I believe that many from that generation and the generation just after left the church without ever leaving the pews. They remained affiliated, they kept the obligation, but they were never really on fire for the gospel. We had big numbers, yes, but numbers can be deceptive. Attendance is not the same as discipleship. Today, such pressures do not exist in most of the United States. In fact, there are more social pressures not to attend Mass. If you're at Mass on a Sunday morning right now, willing to say publicly that you are a Christian, is because you want to be there and are willing to make a sacrifice for it. It's why, in 1971, theologian Karl Rahner famously wrote, the devout Christian of the future will either be a mystic, one who has experienced something, or he will cease to be anything at all. Those who don't see the purpose in it, who don't have any strong sense of their salvation in Christ, are just staying home now. Today, I can look out on the congregation and know almost for sure that everyone there has faith and that they want to get involved. There are definitely some challenges to a smaller congregation, sure, but let's not overlook the incredible upside to having a more convicted congregation. Like the fact that for maybe the first time in our history, we have a congregation ready and able to become missionaries in our own land. And just in the nick of time, right? If we were in the position now, 50, 100 years ago, we'd be stuck. Evangelization was only really the talk of missionaries in foreign nations. The average person in America had nothing to do with it because what was the point? America was a Christian nation. Catholics were already huge in number. Who didn't know the gospel? Not only has the culture largely turned away from faith today, it has been long enough since the major exoduses of faith 
that we essentially get a chance to start over. We're at a point now where an entire generation of people didn't grow up with Christianity and know almost nothing about it. They don't have any faith, which is obviously unfortunate, but they also don't have the baggage that previous generations did either. They don't come with a negative experience with a nun, a fallout with a priest. They come with almost nothing at all. What an incredible opportunity we have today. Nearly every situation, every person we meet is a new occasion to share our faith, to help someone grow closer to Christ. No longer must one travel to a foreign land and learn another language to spread the faith. We can do it right now in our own backyards. Which, as you can imagine, is going to be pretty essential for the future. As previous generations fade away and the power of the church slips, it's going to take a change in mindset to stay alive. Being active in the church is no longer about maintaining what previous generations have built. It's about going on mission and rebuilding it from the ground up. When we look at our world and see how divided it is, we can no longer look away and say, not my problem. We have an obligation to be reconcilers, to be peacemakers, to shape a culture that no longer resembles the Christian faith that once founded it. Naturally, there is a bit of sadness that comes from losing so much of our past, and I don't mean to diminish that, but there's also something freeing about it as well. It's something I hear all the time from younger guys joining the Friars. They want to be pastors, not CEOs. They want to evangelize and catechize, not manage portfolios. It's about relationships, not real estate. Evangelism, not eminence. If you ask me, all of this sounds really exciting. The parish may no longer be the hub of social and political life like it was 80 years ago, but do we really want it to be? Maybe it's a blessing that we don't have the resources to have our own softball league or bingo nights. Maybe it's freeing that the priest is no longer the legal authority in small towns. Those things made us popular and able to shape the culture, sure, but they also made us self-reliant and content, happy to look around at our kingdoms with pride. Maybe having the walls fall down is exactly what we need to remind us that it is not our kingdom that we are building, that our home is not in this world, but that we are here to serve at the will of God. I remember the friars once discussing the bleak outlook they had for the future, how we'd have to give up ministries, how we couldn't do as much as we used to. There was a bit of despair in their voices. And then another friar spoke up with a heavy dose of sarcasm and said, well, I guess if all our money and friars and ministry are gone, we'll just have to rely on God for once. The conversation ended there. If there is one thing that is apparent from our world today, it is that we can no longer rely on the power and influence of our past efforts. The church does not offer much control as a social institution any longer. All that's left is what we should have been looking to from the beginning. As we grow smaller and as we grow weaker, there are many who will lament the past and long for an era of glory. But not me. Ahead of us is a tough road for sure, but it is one with a stronger, more intimate congregation that is humble before God and excited to share what they found with the world. We are a church now that does not simply exist behind its walls waiting for heaven. We are a church with a mission. The wealth, power, and numbers may be gone, but I'll take what we have right now over all that. Honestly, I could not be more excited for where we are now and what is ahead of us. And I'm looking forward to watching so many of you take the leap of faith to be a part of it. As a faithful mother or father, as a catechist, evangelist, liturgist, maybe even as a priest, a deacon, or religious. If there was ever a time to make a difference in the church, I tell you, it's now.